In this video, Jennifer Fulweiler, a renowned comedian, uh, shares her story on how she came to salvific faith after being raised as an atheist. And it's amazing what God uses to open the eyes of those who deny him, rebel against him, and reject him. Take a look at this video. My dad would say, and if he were here, and he actually thought about coming, which would have been weird, if he were here, I think that he would say that he did not raise me to be an atheist per se. He was, he's, he was really big on this idea of seek truth and question assumptions. Even if it's something that I, as your father, am telling you, question it. Seek truth. And so that, that, would, that would end up being a very important part of my childhood, that it wasn't just we're atheists, so go be an atheist. It was seek truth, question assumptions. And so I did, and as a young person, that seemed to lead me to atheism. I went to college, I actually started out at a, at a very religious public university, and I transferred to the University of Texas at Austin because it had a reputation for being very secular. At my previous university, it was like, you know, they'd have Bible studies and stuff, and I got to UT and I thought, ah, atheists, yeah, this is, this is much more like it. The college atheists who I hung out with, and, and really even some of the professors, they were really a testament to just how much our education system has lost a sense of history when it comes to philosophy and the liberal arts. I mean, I would actually hear professors say things like, well, people b believe in God started because people didn't know how to explain things before science, and that's the only reason anyone ever believes. And, you know, now that I have studied a, a little bit of philosophy, I'm no expert, but now that I've just cracked the surface on it, I think, I cannot believe that people got away with saying that at an institution of higher learning. I mean, have you never read the ancient Greek philosophers? I mean, you might not agree with them, but there's this whole wealth of knowledge that they were not drawing from. And what it, it reminds me of is one of my very favorite quotes ever sums up this whole phenomenon. It was the London Review of Books, their review of, I believe it was The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, otherwise known as your, your atheist relative's favorite book, I'm sure. They said of The God Delusion, I'm imagine someone holding forth on biology whose only knowledge of the subject is the British Book of Birds, and you have a rough idea of what it feels like to read Richard Dawkins on theology. <laughs> so, I love that, and that, that really perfectly encapsulates what I experienced among atheists, even in a university setting. But I began to notice some, some problems would come up that, that people couldn't really answer that well. For example, Someone asked one time in, in an atheist group that I was meeting with, um, you know, how do, we, how do we know that it's the right thing to do to, to be a good person, for example, to just, you know, give back to others, maybe volunteer at a homeless shelter? Because the group that I was with, they were really into that. They, they really did want to be good people, like my parents, you know, serve the community, give back. And so they said, you know, from an atheistic point of view, obviously we're not like those silly Christians whose God tells them what to do. But so, so how do we know that it's the right thing to do? And um, the, the person in the room who was considered, you know, very intellectual and knowledgeable said, oh, well, yes, you know, if you look at evolution, you can see that humans thrive. Uh, they, they function best when they are in peaceful communities. It, it leads to harmony. And, and therefore, we, we have a gene. It's, you know, hardwired into us um, to seek peaceful communities. And, but I was sitting there thinking, um, well, yeah, but you can also look at the evidence from evolution to see that evolution kind of favors survival of the fittest, too, the strong dominating the weak. So it seems like from, an atheist, from a purely atheist materialist perspective, you could also concoct a moral code in which beating up the weak and the poor and stealing their stuff so that you can be rich and your offspring can survive seems like that could also be perfectly justifiable from the atheist material, materialist perspective. And when I would bring up these issues to sum up, you know, there were a lot of discussions, but one summary of the, um, of the typical response I got was along the lines of, shut up. So a year later, our first child was born, and that was the real starting point of my conversion. You can see that the stage had kind of already been set. My, you know, I was already thinking in a certain direction. But when I held that baby, that was the first moment of realizing that 
there were some real problems with atheism and that it was time to address them. Because, you know, in the spirit of uh, another thing that my dad always taught me was this idea of follow your beliefs to their logical conclusions. Don't just say you believe something, but then don't walk the walk when the going gets tough. You have to follow your belief to their logical conclusions. And so I held my newborn son, this amazing miracle, and I was like, what a gorgeous, randomly evolved set of chemical reactions. What is the atheism is nonsense. What is this? Because I, I, I remembered it that when I was in college, there was this professor, I, I can't think of his name, some of you have probably heard of him. He made the statement, he's a big atheist, he made the statement that it would be more morally acceptable to kill a newborn baby than an adult pig because pigs are more cognitively complex. And that has stayed with me all those years, because at the time that I read that paper, I was like, this is garbage, he's making atheists look bad. And I was like, that is wrong, because, um, well, actually, you know, essentially complexity is how you derive value. And I looked at my newborn son, and I thought, well, I mean, pigs are pretty smart. I mean, like, the pig is more cognitively complex than this newborn. And I realized that by my own atheist materialist worldview, I was saying that my baby was not as valuable as an adult human being because he was not as cognitively complex. So that was wrong. <laughs> I sensed this love that I felt for him. And again, in the spirit of being you know, intellectually honest, I said, okay, where, where does this love come from that I'm experiencing? I thought, well, it's just a feeling, it's just chemical reactions in my brain, and I thought, that's not true. That is not true. I know that the love that I feel for my son and that I've experienced in, in this little family of ours has a source that is somewhere outside of us. I don't know what it is, I don't know who it is, but I know that it's there. And that if the whole world blew up tomorrow and there was nothing left of us, that that love would still be real, and it would still exist. So seven months went by, and I had actually kind of forgotten about it. And then a funny thing happened. I was going to a bookstore to, you know, find some, just some reading to, to pass the time. I had no particular agenda. And it was a weird thing. As I was walking in the store, the only way I can describe it is to say that it's almost like there was a light on this one book at, at, at the back of the room. I mean, there wasn't literally, but it, I was so drawn to this book and I just had to go see what it was. And so I had my baby with me and I, I pushed the stroller back there and I laughed when I saw that it was in the Christianity section. And the last time I was in the Christianity section of anything was when I was in the fourth grade, I took the Bibles in our library and I put them in the fiction section, which I thought was like the most edgy atheist joke the whole fourth grade had ever seen. So, but I hadn't been back to the Christianity section since, and I was about to walk away, but then I saw that the book was called The Case for Christ, and, and there was some tagline or something that said that the author used to be an atheist. And I thought, like, oh, that's ridiculous. Like, I did, this will be fun. You know, take this book apart. That's, you know, this is just going to be absurd. And I found that the book was actually not too bad. And one of the things was is that I noticed this guy spoke my language. In, in the case for Christ, I'll just give you one example of, of a point that he made through interviews with, with um, Christian experts. He made some points that just kind of got me thinking. I wasn't convinced, but they got me thinking. Like, for example, this um, a philosopher, a Protestant philosopher named J.P. Moreland, Strobel, Strobel interviewed him, and this guy pointed out that, um, it, that what you see when you, when you look at first century Palestine is that, you know, there were all these Jews that for centuries, through unspeakable persecution, they had held to these religious and social structures such as animal sacrifice and, and keeping the Sabbath. And, and nothing, you know, not, not the worst persecution that the world could throw at them would, would get them to let go of these, these customs. And so, and this is a quote from, from him in the case for Christ, he says, these Jews, they, they believe that to abandon these institutions would be to risk their souls being damned to hell after death. Now, a rabbi named Jesus appears from a lower class region. He teaches for three years, gathers a following of lower and middle class people, gets in trouble with the authorities, and gets crucified along with 30,000 other Jewish men who are also executed during that period. But five weeks after he's crucified, 
Over 10,000 Jews are following him and claiming that he is the initiator of a new religion. And get this, they're willing to give up or alter all five of the social institutions that they have been taught since childhood have such important, both sociologically and theologically. And Moreland says, and it's kind of hard to argue with, you have to admit that something explosive happened to Jewish culture in first century Palestine. Atheist or Christian, you have to admit something happened. And his own explanation was simple. They'd seen Jesus risen from the dead. You know, the resurrection has had a opportunity in many ways to open the eyes of people who initially did not believe in Jesus Christ. You know, when you compare, compare Christianity to other faiths, in particular, let's look at um, Islam. Muhammad is still in a grave. Let's look at Buddha, still in a grave. But then when you look at Christianity, Jesus has risen from the dead, according to the scriptures. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, tells us something as we read through these series of verses. It says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Cephas is Peter. And then to the 12, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have already fallen asleep or died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Here Paul says, yes, Christ has been risen from the dead. And he goes around showing himself to different people. According to Acts chapter one, he did this by many infallible proofs. He allowed people to see him, to handle him, and to touch him. And here Paul says that I'm the last person to see him, one that wasn't even fit to even lay eyes upon him. Verse nine says, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed. And then when you go over to verse 32, Paul begins to lay out a case and remind his listeners that he had a rough time in Ephesus to the point that he likens his, his encounter to something being animalistic. He said in verse 32, if I fought with beast in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? So if I'm fighting for the faith, contending for the faith, risking my life at Ephesus, Paul was almost killed because he went around preaching that these figurines and statues that you all had erected in that region, that they were not gods because they were made by man's hands. And they wanted to kill him for this. So he wanted to go into the arena, but they would not allow him to do so because his life would be in danger. So Paul says here that, listen, I went through a bitter scourging as a result of my stand for Christ. And if Christ is still asleep, if he hasn't risen from the dead, you know, what's the whole point? He says, if I fought with wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? What benefit is it to me? 
if the dead are not raised. He says, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ is crystallized in the fact that Jesus Christ conquered the grave. He conquered death, thereby being the atonement for sin. He is our propitiation for sin. And listen to, listening to this story of this co comedian who was once on the path of atheism, but she caught a glimpse of the hope of Christ through the resurrection, reminds me that people can still be brought to salvific faith today only if they will have the opportunity to hear the gospel and to hear truth. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. God bless you.